Okay, everybody, we're going to get uh, started. Uh, once again, thanks for spending some of your uh, evening with me. Uh, the plan tonight is we're going to be looking at ideas within chapter two. I think we're going to come uh, really close to wrapping up all of it. We might not get to some of the aspects of naming right at the bottom, um, but I, I'm quite confident that we're going to get uh, the bulk of this done. Um, a lot of really interesting ideas. We're going to start out revisiting something that we talked a little bit about last time and was also found in a pre-class video of um, keeping track with atomic symbols for the different subatomic particles that are present. And then we're also gonna look at an idea at the start of class involving um, what's called a mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometer is a, uh, it's a modern instrument. Many different chemistry labs uh, have mass spectrometers of different degrees of sophistication. It's not gonna be something you use in, um, one of your own general chemistry labs, but it, it's a really common um, laboratory instrument. Uh, I think uh, all of these ideas within chapter two, I, I'm a big fan of them. I'm really interested in these. So I feel, uh, I feel lucky that I can share some ideas with y'all. So within this one, I wanna be very specific and deliberate to try to, uh, try to point out the ideas and skills that you're, we're gonna use for our upcoming exam. And so for all of these, once again, I'm trying to name specifically the objective or the skill that we're going to wanna to have for each of the different sections of chapter two. Now, as I look at this, as far as where we're at and where we're going, um, let's first of all, pause and think of a couple things that we saw back within chapter one. So one of the skills that we had in there were questions involving significant figures when we had them in calculations where we had a mix of operations that might be addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. So that's something that you, you might've been practicing. You might've done homework problems on, you might've been thinking about it in, in different ways. So let me start by asking you about that. By asking that, I want you to respond to this uh, statement. I'm gonna shoot you a poll. I can successfully answer questions involving significant figures in calculations. Is that something that you strongly disagree with for yourself or strongly agree? Take about 10 more seconds. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna stop that one, uh, sharing with you all. Uh, I'd say by and large, class is pretty confident on that. Being in the categories of four or five, I, excellent. I know that that's definitely gonna be a question that's gonna show up on your first exam. If I think of another question or topic from chapter one that I know is gonna be on your exam, um, it involves dimensional analysis, how that can show up in story problems. Um, it might be involving cubic units. Connected to that would be knowing different metric conversions. All of that is in this category of dimensional analysis. So I, same question, same format. When it comes to dimensional analysis, I'm curious, uh, give me your, your view on that. Are you confident you'd be successful or, or less so? Take about 10 more seconds. So uh, sharing the results with that one, I'm, go I'm gonna trust your metacognition on this. I'm gonna trust that you are appraising your own skill level. And what you're telling me is the dimensional analysis one is one that you perceive might be more difficult. So what I do is I'll, I'll put together some resources that I can share with you all. Um, I'll send it your, your way through Carmen um, tomorrow. 
in case you want some additional practice. But I, I really appreciate the, in, appreciate the insight you're telling me is what you think are strengths or weaknesses. And let's see if we can move forward and make it so you're more confident as well with the dimensional analysis side. So that's something I'll end up sharing um, with you all tomorrow. Now, uh, back to the ideas then within chapter two. If I look at the ideas within chapter two, let's begin by looking at this idea of the mass spectrometer, how that fits with isotope calculations and different subatomic particles. And if I stack up the degree of difficulty for chapter two, two of these are, are near the top as far as more challenging uh, for students. Qu questions involving isotope calculations and the mass spectrometer. So that's why I wanted to make sure I gave you sort of a, a preview of that within the pre-class video. When it comes to subatomic particles, students do very well with that. That's probably a 90% question. So um, first of all, within here, when we're thinking at the start of chapter two, we had different experiments and the contributions of Thompson, uh, Millikan, and Rutherford. Suggestion for you, if you're trying to sort of organize your ideas around these, um, I recommended being able to sketch each of the different experiments. To me, that, that helps me sort of summarize and remember what's going on. Another suggestion for this one I found would be to, be, let's say, pick two of the experiments and make a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram, like in the blue circle, would be things pertaining to cathode rays. The red would be pertaining to the oil drop experiment. And in between would be things that are common to both. So in order to fill in something like this for yourself, you need to know what was going on. So for example, if I'm thinking about those experiments, both involve in some way the charge of the electrons. Both are involved in electric fields. Thompson's invest investigation of cathode rays was looking at a charge to mass ratio. The cathode rays were being deflected and he used a magnetic field as well. When I'm thinking of Millikan, well, he was suspending the drops and measuring the velocity with which they are rising and falling. Gravity was important and he was able to determine the mass of the particles. Now, what I've put in the circles right here, this is not crucial, meaning I wouldn't ask you to race and fill in that information. I'm just pointing out this is a helpful way to process and do comparisons across things. I find a Venn diagram is a good way to sort of test yourself and consolidate your own understanding. Now, when we're looking then in section 2.3 and we're looking at subatomic particles, this is something we started with last time where we introduced the proton, the neutron, and the electron. We saw that they had different charges, positive for the proton, negative for the electron, neutral for the neutron. Those particular values are in increments of the fundamental charge. The smallest amount of charge is the charge that the electron has. And that same magnitude of charge, that's the charge of the proton. So when we're seeing this plus one or minus one, it's in units of that amount of charge. This is not something you'd, ha you'd have to do calculations with, but that's what that term, that notation means, plus one and minus one. If we look over here at the mass, we see that an electron has a mass, but it's much, much, much smaller than the mass of the proton or the neutron. When we're looking then at our symbols, the subscript was the number of protons. The superscript above that was the overall mass. And if it is a neutral atom, the number of protons and electrons are the same. Now, you can keep the same number of protons, but vary the number of neutrons, which will then vary the overall mass. And we saw those were called isotopes. Now, what if we varied the number of the protons and the electrons? What if those are somehow different? That was the idea that we'd have an overall charge then. If the overall charge is positive, that's called a cation. And we would get to that by removing an electron. The, neg the net charge will be negative if we add an electron, and that's called an anion. Those symbols right there, those show up as a superscript. Now, a uh, student had this question, which I thought was a good one, about when we're adding or removing electrons here, is that like a physical process? Does that just happen with, uh, in nature? How does that come about? Really good question. Okay, this is something that it turns out that the um, ancient Greeks first discovered, uh, this material amber. It turns out that if you rub that with a substance like wool, you would find that it would then be attracted to different, um, uh, different substances. And that 
it's what the Greeks were really discovering is the idea of static electricity. The idea that by removing the electrons, just by friction, then it will cause this attraction. And in fact, the Greek word for amber is electron. That's where it comes from. It's related to this static electricity. Now, I, I'm sure with static electricity, that's a phenomenon you're familiar with. If you take like a balloon, especially on a, um, a dry day, rub it against a sweater. After that, then it can be drawn and stick to other things. The way that we understand this now in terms of the static electricity is that in that process of rubbing, what's happening is we have electrons being transferred. They're being transferred from one substance to another. After that, we'll have now opposites attract and that's what's causing them to be attracted and come back together. So the reason I'm pointing this out is we want to be careful and recognize that when it comes to the transfer of the charge here, the particle that is coming and going is the electron. The electron, it turns out, is relatively easy to move from one substance to another. And something just like friction can cause that to happen. Now, when we're looking then at the different subatomic particles, there was a FET semi recommended that showed the different um, the parts that we had there. We saw that the, we were putting the protons and the neutrons within the nucleus, and that if you have electrons, those would be found outside of it. So we see within that symbolism right here, this would be for two protons, two neutrons, and no electrons. Overall charge of plus two. Now, some students had some good questions about, well, where does the electron go? And there's different models for that. There's different ways that we can think about that. What does it mean to have a bookkeeping approach where it seems like they're in a ring or in this other cloud description? We're gonna look a lot more closely at that when we talk about uh, where the electrons are found and that's gonna be in chapter six. Now, something we practiced last time was looking at a given combination of protons, neutrons, electrons and see how that would correspond to different symbols. So last time we were looking at a question like this and using the periodic table, I think is really important because if we look at the periodic table for a given symbol, it will tell us how many protons are present. When I was looking at how students were doing this within the perusal video, people were doing great. Uh, I found it helpful when some folks even uploaded a picture to that. So it was really easy to see the work in all the different parts. Another question that we had on this was one where now it was sort of a back and forth, a combination of different symbols or a different numbers of subatomic particles or different mass or charge information, but it still gave you enough information to figure out all the parts. Here was another one that I saw a student had done. It was even color coded where they were showing what was originally there and then adding in information for the other parts. I think overall this idea of being able to look at the relationships between protons, neutrons, electrons, how that's represented in terms of the charge and how that's represented in terms of the mass. I think people really were doing well with that. So that's the first learning objective I wanna make clear. I am really confident you're gonna have an exam question that asks you to interpret symbols like this or construct symbols. And that's one that I, that I think you're gonna do very well on. That's usually a 90% question for the class. I list here, uh, I don't want you to do them right now, but I list here some end of chapter problems that are exactly on this topic. So if you need more practice, you can work on them right here. If you want to take practice and get feedback on it, what I'd suggest that you do is work on these and give your answers when this video is posted to perusal, because then I can check your work. Now, next topic that we had within our early video was involving the operation of a mass spectrometer. I use this one where we can begin to think about, well, what would it mean if we're trying to look at different atoms that had the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons? How, how would we begin to experimentally measure something like that? A mass spectrometer would give us information like that. So here's a view of a mass spectrometer. So in this case, we're beginning by introducing chlorine atoms. The first thing that happens is that they're being ionized. And if I look to see that, I see that as they move through the instrument, they're now Cl plus. 
So what I think is happening is I think that they're going into the instrument and when they're being ionized, they're being made into cations. This first part right here is that idea of making a positive beam of ions. They're being accelerated through. And then the second part is they pass through this magnetic field and notice their pathways are different. They have the same charge, but what's different would be the corresponding mass. And that puts them on a different trajectory as they go through the instrument. Uh, I saw this comment within Peruso, a really good one, where this person's connecting this idea to what we talked about last time. This is really similar to what happens with J.J. Thompson's investigation of cathode rays. And in fact, a mass spectrometer, it's invented in J.J. Thompson's lab. He's recalled the one who was changing the trajectory of the uh, cathode rays. So to me, a mass spectrometer, it's also related back to this um, image that we looked at last time, where we were looking at the trajectory of particles as they go through either an electric or a magnetic field. So I'm gonna indicate that as another exam learning objective. The fact that this kind of representation works both for section 2.2 and in section, I don't know, what are we in 2.3 or 2.4? When we're talking about mass spectrometer, I think that's sort of a unifying idea and I think it would be an important one that could show up on the test. I have here another representation or simulation for what takes place in a mass spectrometer. So within this case, particles are being introduced and they're trying to show you have three different types. That's what the uh, red, the green and the blue is indicating. They're on different pathways through the instrument because they have different masses. So what the instrument does is it scans through different magnetic field strengths and notice that changes the tra trajectory. Depending on the field strength, different ones reach the detector where they're counted. That's how a mass spectrometer works. And again, this is a very common laboratory instrument. Now, the information that you'd get within that, let's say you were testing your chlorine atoms. When they go through the instrument, what you end up finding here, this would be the kind of output that you get. There's two different peaks, one really centered at a mass of 35 and another at a mass of 37. Now, uh, Gregory made a comment within here. Well, what would be the purpose behind there being multiple different isotopes? They have relatively the same properties. Uh, what's the purpose on that? I think that's coming at it a little bit backwards. It's not like scientists say, okay, well, let me make different isotopes. The different isotopes are made when different atoms were first made. This is a connection between where the atoms come from and astronomy. Something like chlorine, that's made in a process called nucleosynthesis in a supernova, okay? So that's where the chlorine is actually coming from. So we're not necessarily controlling and say, well, let me make more of this isotope or that other isotope. Uh, that's what God did. We're just looking at the abundance that we have for the different distribution of isotopes in the samples that we have in the world around us. Now, if I looked within this one, I see more of chlorine 35 than chlorine 37. And if I were to look at exactly the lines that they're on, I could look at the peak height and come up with a calculation to say, well, what would be the proportions of each? This is something I looked at within the video and I find that I've got about 75% of chlorine 35 and about 25% of chlorine 37. So what would I would then use, I would use that information to say, okay, let's say I have, I don't know, a million chlorine atoms. What would be the mass that I would use for a chlorine atom when I have a million of them? Well, I'm going to have some that are chlorine 35 and some that are chlorine 37. I need to somehow account for the amounts that I have of each of those. A calculation that I do with that, it takes the form of what I have up here at the top. Within this expression right here, I am able to get what is called the weighted average mass. The terms that I have in here are the percentage of a component and its mass value added to the percentage of another and its mass value. And by, uh, when I say percentage, I've turned it into a decimal form. So this would be an expression where I have 75% of chlorine 35, 
25% chlorine 37. The resulting weighted average mass is combining all of those terms. And that's what shows up on the periodic table. So the, all of these values you notice, they might be close to a specific value, but for all of these, we have examples of different isotopes. So for all of these, what shows up on the periodic table is a combination of what isotopes are present and what is their natural abundance. Now, being able to set up and do a calculation like that, that's definitely a learning objective. I'm very confident that you're gonna have a calculation involving using an expression like this. So let me show you a few different ways. And if you got a pencil handy, I want you to try to set these up, okay? So here would be an example. Lithium has two principal isotopes. There's lithium-6 with a mass 6.0151, and that's 7.59% of what you find. The other is lithium-7, and the mass is 7.016. What I'd like you to do is try to set up this calculation. See if you can take the information. See if you can set up the appropriate equation that you can use to solve for the average mass of lithium that you'd find on the periodic table. Take a second, see if you can set that up for me. Then I'll show you my work. Okay, so if we're setting up this, I see that I have both of the masses. I have one of the percentages. What would be the other percent? Well, I'm gonna use the information that there are two principal isotopes. They're gonna add up to 100%. I have one of the values right here. So I would just subtract 100 minus 7.59 and that would tell me the second one. So I would use this information to set it up this way. I have one of the mass values in its percentage added to the other mass value in its percentage. I have everything that I need now to calculate the value, which would be the weighted average mass that shows up on the periodic table. Tell me within this one, if, if you've got something, a specific question pertaining to this, tell me in the chat, please. Okay, a um, couple of different questions within this one. Uh, one question was pertaining to significant figures. Uh, I would probably, if I'm working through this one, I would be using significant figures, especially if the question is asking me to report it using the correct number of significant figures. What we're gonna find is it, it never hurts to attend to that particular information. Um, the uh, but I, I, let, let's not overdwell on it in this particular case. Second question that I saw was, how did I come up with the second percentage value? I'm using that information that there are two principal isotopes. Two principal meaning that those two, when I add them together, they're gonna equal 100%. And therefore, if you've, um, uh, if you've got a 7.59 for one of them, the other one is this 92% and change. Okay, now this is one way that I've seen this question, very common. Mass values are given, you're using to get to some percentages and you come up with then what would be on the periodic table. Let me show you another format that I've seen. So this one says that boron has two principal isotopes. There's boron 10 and boron 11. So boron 10 is really close to a value of 10. Boron 11 is really close to a value of 11. Says so the periodic table lists a mass of 
what would be the natural abundance for each of the isotope? So notice this one, it's telling me that there are two principal isotopes. It's telling me the mass value for each, and I need to figure out the percentages. This one, if you want to say, has sort of a trick. It's got something that we need to attend to in order to get started on this. Because initially, it seems like we have two different variables. There's the percentage for boron 10 and the percentage for boron 11. But it turns out we only have one variable in this expression. We only have one variable because the percentages are going to add up to 100%. I know that because it has two principal isotopes. The percentage of one plus the percentage of the other adds up to 100%. So it turns out we only have one variable in this expression. We have one variable because we could call one of the percentages x and call the other percentage one minus x because after all, they add up to 100%. Now, if I were to look at both of these percentages, my hunch is I'm going to have more of the boron 11 because after all, the value ends up being closer to the uh, mass of 11. It's at 10.8. So if I were to take this through and solve for x, sure enough, that's what I get. So this is another format that I've seen for this uh, question. It's the same general expression that I'm using of percentage times mass plus percentage times mass equals the weighted average value. This one though is asking us to solve for the percentages. So I've seen this as well. I'm gonna call this whole thing once again a learning objective. I know that you have a question of some type involving this weighted average mass. It could take different forms, but I definitely expect that on your test. Now, something else pertaining to the mass spectrometer I show here. This is one that I, I know that we've had actually as an exam question. This is one I, I took off a previous exam. So this one says in nature, magnesium consists of three isotopes. A sample of magnesium was measured in a mass spectrometer. The output shows the peaks based on their mass to charge ratio. Select the mass spectrometer output for a sample of magnesium. So I see that it has three isotopes. So I see three peaks in each case. That part seems consistent. If I look at the periodic table, I find that magnesium has a value for its weighted average mass of 24.3. So I know that that has to also be consistent with the correct choice. So when I was looking at the analysis folks did, I saw a lot of really good ideas. Um, in this case, for example, it says I'm between the idea here, the choices of one and three. They end up settling on one because they're saying, well, to the naked eye, they think that that one's probably better. Now, I agree with them of saying, well, two and four don't look like they're gonna have a weighted average mass of 24.3, but one and three might. So I, I can see where they were coming at it, coming at that question from. These three responses, very similar. JT says, well, I know that two and four can't be right because if you were to go through and either estimate or calculate, it's not gonna give you a value of 24.3. Down here at the bottom left, CK says, I think number three is correct. And what they're trying to do within that, they're trying once again to sort of come up with an estimate for what would be the correct one. Now, the person who really nailed it and added an additional idea, which I think is important, was Allison's description here. Allison began by talking about the amounts that we would have, but notice what Allison then adds. I know that graph three is not cre correct because an atom must have a whole number value for its measured atomic mass. The average can be a decimal, but notice what she's pointing out. In case one, the values that we would be working from would be right at 24, 25 and 26. And the one here at the bottom, well, we're in between for all of those. I think Allison nails it on this one. I know the correct choice here was number one because what the test writers were trying to test were two different ideas. One is the output in a mass spectrometer. It has to be whole numbers because each of the ones we saw for when we are looking at chlorine for all of those, right? Those are whole number values. The only way that we end up, as Allison says, having values as a decimal, 
that's when we end up taking it and taking it as the weighted average mass. And that's a second feature that was being tested here. Now, this would be another aspect, I think, uh, as far as a mass spectrometer, interpreting the output for something like that. And like I said, this was an exam question, so I know that this is a learning objective. Now, when it comes to uh, using a mass spectrometer, you could look at a single sample like magnesium, but in an actual lab, they look at more complex samples. So this would be the mass spectrometer output, it turns out, for trinitrotoluene or TNT. So this particular molecule, this would be what its mass spectrum looks like. Um, another one that I found that was quite topical, this would be the mass spectrum output for um, our, uh, our, the bane of our current existence involving uh, COVID-19. So this would be doing an analysis of that. Now, these ideas here at the start then of chapter two, uh, I've spent a little bit of time here on the front end looking at this idea of atomic symbols and keeping track of our subatomic particles. And then also some aspects of a mass spectrometer, how it functions, the kind of output you get, and importantly, calculations involving that. So what I'd like to do right now is, is I'm thinking about you know, your current view within that. Give me an assessment of how you think you can do on each of these. So this first one, what do you think about when it comes to this idea of atomic symbols, whether it's for a neutral atom or an ion? What's your metacognition tell you on that? Take about 10 more seconds. I'll share the answers with you on that one. Okay, so um, I, I appreciate your input within this one. I would say that at level four, that tells me it's something that you need to practice a little bit more and then you're definitely gonna master it. I shared a couple um, examples earlier within the talk here. I think with practice, you're gonna turn that into a question that you're absolutely gonna get. Cause I know that's typically a 90% question. If you're further on down with that, Definitely practice it because I know that that's one that you can mas master. Now, another topic that we had within that one involved aspects of calculations involving isotopes. Tell me your, your perspective on that. Respond to the statement, I can successfully perform calculations involving isotopic data. Take about 10 more seconds. Okay, at least within your views, I think you're, you're giving me uh, a pretty similar assessment. I think that it, you're saying it's perhaps a little bit more difficult, but overall, I think it's something that within practice, it's suggesting to me that you're gonna have a really good chance with those types of questions. Last one within that set, tell me about your view when it comes to questions about a mass spectrometer and its output. What's your perspective on that? Take about 10 more seconds. And uh, the consensus there is that one's probably your weakest out of these three within the set. All, all of that's really helpful for me. 
when it comes to these um, aspects of the mass spectrometer and mass spectrometer calculations, uh, here's some suggested problems. So these are ones that are at the end of the chapter. Some of these are gonna show up within your master in chemistry homework assignment. But if you feel like these are a weakness for you right now, begin to address it, okay? Don't, don't be passive. If you know that this is something that you haven't mastered yet, now's the time to master it. So the kinds of questions, I, I, there's quite a few end of chapter ones on this topic. There's general ones just about the phenomena itself. There's ones where you're being asked to do calculations. That's what I see here in question 2.35. Here's ones where there's making connections for what a mass spectrometer output might look like. Within your exam, it's not gonna be, here's an essay, tell me how a mass spectrometer functions. So these questions right here, I think this is a good way to begin to think about, well, how might I have a question pertaining to a mass spectrometer? So again, 2.37, 2.38, these are good examples. 2.39, I like this one a lot for several reasons. So first of all, look at that one. This is giving you the different abundance values for different isotopes of magnesium. I like it because it has two different things it's asking. It's saying, what is the average atomic mass? So it's saying, do the calculation. And then it says, sketch the mass spectrum. That's connected to, well, what would that output now look like? So all of these, I think, are, are really on the, um, on the mark if you want to practice. Once again, this will be um, something that you can work on independently. Or if you want to respond within the posted perusal video on this, we can definitely share ideas there. So I've been spending time here looking at the first part of class on the mass spectrometer, isotope calculations, and descriptions for subatomic particles. Now let's move into aspects in the second half of the chapter. Now, one thing that we're going to look at, we've already seen some of this vocabulary before. In chapter one, we talked about molecules and how molecules could be compounds if we had different um, elements present. Now we're going to begin to think about ions and when they form compounds. And importantly, we wanna co contrast those. What happens when we're talking about these when they're um, what we're gonna call molecular compounds and ionic ones? So within the pre-class video, we were looking at a few different uh, ways to talk about uh, molecular substances and ionic compounds. Those are related to this idea of, can we describe what's going on at the particle level? So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and then as time allows, we're gonna move in to this whole cluster of ones at the bottom, which all have to do with different aspects of naming. So uh, ideas that we had within the uh, pre-class video, and if I could just pause for a second, folks are making outstanding contributions there. I'm so impressed with the questions that you're asking, the responses that you're having, just, just really impressive. I think it's gonna be a great resource for us to continue on in this strange world where we have to communicate uh, asynchronously. So I, I'm really impressed with what I'm seeing within that space. Now, when it comes to looking at uh, molecular and ionic substances, two different things we want to attend to. The composition, which are the atoms that are present, and then the structure, which has to do with how they're arranged. So we can quickly classify things as being what are called molecular substances or ionic because molecular ones include nonmetals and ionic include a metal cation and a nonmetal anion. That's sort of our definition for both. Now we need to learn, well, what are nonmetals and what are metal cations and nonmetal anions? Once we know that, then we can easily classify these. So here's a color-coded periodic table. All the things that are shown in red, all the elements that are shown in red are metals. The ones that are shown in blue are nonmetals. So quick thought is from the left-hand side of the periodic table over, I have so many metals that are present. The nonmetals are found way over on the right-hand side. The only one I sort of have to be a little careful with is hydrogen. That's also a nonmetal. Now, when these become ions, my metals are going to become cations, and my nonmetals, I see those as anions. Now, within here, uh, I was having a conversation with a student, and they remarked, I noticed the video says when metals become ions, 
they typically become cations. Would there be a scenario where that doesn't take place? And my response, if I jump down to that for Veronica's question, it's not gonna be impossible to make a metal into an anion. You can definitely make that happen. When I say definitely make that happen, you can have a lab instrument that does that for sure. But I go on to say here that what frequently occurs in our everyday world is that we see the electrons being transferred between our particles here. There's sort of a tug of, a tug of war that goes on. And usually in this tug of war, the metals end up losing their electrons. When we're looking at the relative amount of attraction for the electrons, we're gonna find many times the metals, it's easy to remove the electron from them. And that's gonna be something that we're gonna build up to. Chapter seven is a really deep look at why this takes place. But I can make a metal an anion, I can make a non-metal a cation. Because after all, when I was looking at what took place in a mass spectrometer, that was involving in this figure, chlorine, which is a non-metal. Typically, I would say in this tug of war, it becomes a anion, but clearly in this lab experiment, it was possible to turn it into a cation as well. Now, if I look then at the charges for how many electrons I'm adding or removing, one thing to be aware of, this first column on the periodic table, many times we would associate those as being plus one when they become an ion. In the next column over, plus two. Jumping over here to aluminum, plus three. Now, if I start way over on the right-hand side, the far most column on the far right-hand side, what are, which are called the noble gases, they typically don't become ions. But then my next column is minus one, minus two, minus three. Knowing this pattern, this is going to be really helpful. You can always use a periodic table as a resource in this class. So a really important thing to know is the charges that I associate with the columns. So if I were to take this description right here, I would add that information. The first column I associate as being plus one cations. The second is plus two. I've got this column plus three. And then if I start from the right-hand side, things that are my noble gases, which are not ions at all, and then minus one, minus two, minus three. That's a pattern that we're gonna find is a very helpful one uh, that gets it started on understanding a lot of chemistry. Now, I noticed within there with hydrogen, remember with hydrogen, we said it's at the top of that column there, but it's a non-metal. So we have to be careful with how we're classifying or dealing with the hydrogen. To say it's a little bit uh, different, um, let's see how we would account for that. And in fact, in this figure at the bottom, you notice what the authors did. They said hydrogen can be plus one, or maybe I wanna think about it as minus one. Within their representation, they were putting it in both of those places. Several of you had questions about this. How come hydrogen can be both a cation and an anion? What's going on with that? For me, it comes back to this idea of there's a tug of war between the elements as far as how tightly the electrons are being attracted. And so if I were to consider hydrogen, I mean, if hydrogen's having a tug of war, let's say hydrogen's this guy on the right, you know, he might be able to win relative to these two little kids, but he's not going to win next to this other comparison here. So a big thing that we're gonna be looking at as far as explaining these charges, we're gonna to have to learn, well, what's giving rise to these attractions in the first place? And the reason hydrogen is in between and sometimes is a cation, sometimes an anion, comes all back to this relative attraction that an electron has when it's in a particular atom. Now, let's see then and switch a little bit to the information that we need to know as we begin to use the language of chemistry here. I've mentioned in uh, when we first began the class, we wanted to know the names and the symbols for various elements. Now, another thing I wanna add to that is we need to make sense of the ones that are common cations and common anions. This is a figure from the e-text, chapter two. I want us to know the cations that are listed there in bold. And a lot of times students will say, well, 
can I have this just written down or do I need to know it? I think it's going to be a great advantage for you if you know it. You don't want to have to keep digging back in the book and saying, oh, well, what is that particular value? You need to be very fluent with this and use the information when you see it. And so I think that you will really benefit from knowing these bold cations. And by knowing them, knowing their charge, and knowing the symbol that goes with it, and knowing the name that goes with it. Now, let me give you some suggestions here to help you out on this. Let me point out a few patterns. So first of all, these ones that I see listed here that have a charge of plus one, a charge of plus two, if I can use a periodic table, I already know that answer. Look at the ones that are listed as being plus one. Lithium, sodium, potassium, these are all plus one because they're in the plus one column. So if I already know their placement on the periodic table, or if I look at their placement on the periodic table, I'm gonna know what charge they're gonna have. Same thing with the next group. If I'm looking at magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, they're in the plus two column. Excellent. By simply looking at their placement on the periodic table, I know that those are gonna be plus two. Now, let me add additional information. I want you to know that that first column, the name for that are called the alkali metals. I show that listed here. There's a couple columns that I, I'm gonna need you to know the names for. The first column there is called the alkali metals. The second column is called the alkaline earth metals. If I were to look at other information on here, aluminum, it says becomes a plus three cation. I look at its placement on the periodic table. Yep, it's in the same spot where I would expect that plus three to be. So I'm pointing out that for several of these, by simply looking at their placement on the periodic table, we already know the answers. Now, how about ones that are not obvious based on the periodic table? Let me help you make sense of those. So I put those in bold right here. Couple ways, couple generalizations for you. How would I make sense of these common cations? I see that many of these are plus two. I see zinc plus two, copper plus two. I see lead plus two. So many of these are plus two. If I'm looking for ones that are not plus two, silver plus one is an exception. If I look and I see iron, I see iron listed twice as iron two plus and iron three plus. Both of these, it turns out, are common in our everyday world. If we want to designate something as either iron two plus or iron three plus, we use Roman numerals. So if I see iron two plus here, notice it has iron and then Roman numeral two. There's also this naming that goes with it, this ferrous one. We're not going to have you use that. So if you know, the, um, how to use the designation with the Roman numeral to designate the charge, you're in good shape. And that's gonna be relevant for both iron two and iron three. The only one that I see on here that sort of somewhat different within that is NH4 plus. I say that's different because that's not just a single um, uh, element all by itself. What I see within that is I see more than one atom together. This is what's called a polyatomic ion. It's a polyatomic cation and it's called ammonium. Ammonium, NH4 plus, I'm gonna ask you to memorize that. It's something that you're gonna see quite a bit. Know the name, know the equation for it, know the charge. So these are the cations, the ones in bold that I want you to become more and more familiar with. Now, what happens if we now look at the anions? Once again, I want you to be able to make sense and know the different anions there that are listed in bold. So notice within here, uh, hydrogen, that was one that it was both a cation and it's also being listed here just to draw your attention to as an anion. If I were to look at these, I see a whole bunch of them once again are consistent with their placement on the periodic table. I see several that are in my minus one column fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. 
I've got my minus two column with oxygen and sulfur, my minus three column with nitrogen. So by looking at where they're placed on the periodic table, I know what the common charges are gonna be. There's another column here that I want you to know the name of, that's that minus one column. The minus one column, those are called the halogens. So I've mentioned where the alkali metals are found, the alkaline earth metals are found, and the halogens. Now, one thing you might want to do is get yourself a good periodic table, print it out, and add this information to it. That's going to be a really good resource that I think you'd be able to have that will help you become familiar with this information. Now, as far as the naming on these, we're going to now begin to switch a little bit to begin to consider the naming. When you have a uh, when we're making our anions, we often have an IDE ending that we add instead. So our halogens, those become halides when they become anions. Notice fluorine became fluoride, chlorine became chloride, bromine, bromide, iodine, iodide, oxygen, oxide, sulfur, sulfide. Even if I looked on nitrogen became nitride. So adding this IDE ending when I take my element and turn it into an anion, that's something we want to be familiar with. Now, if I look at this group, I have important polyatomic ones that I need to memorize. Hydroxide would be an example, acetate, perchlorate, nitrate, carbonate, sulfate, and phosphate. And when I say memorize it, best strategy is you need to have the name, the formula, and know the charge. My strategy for this one, I use flashcards. I, I, and I find that making my own flashcard, meaning writing it out within that, uh, that helps me memorize it too. For me, it helps my coding in my brain when I'm writing things out like that. So I'd like you to be able to um, memorize these polyatomic anions. Now, Right now, if I were to sort of pause for a second and say, well, are these important or not? Turns out this is a, a really important skill that is a good predictor of how you're going to do in the course. It's a good predictor if you're able to memorize information like this. Now that we're going to do a whole bunch of memorizing going forward, but this is so much the language of chemistry. So it's going to be really important to have this kind of information uh, in your memory banks. See how much you can do to make sense of this by the time we meet for our next class. Okay, now I've been talking about the composition of things that end up being called uh, molecular or ionic. And the composition meaning if they had metals, uh, excuse me, non-metals present or this idea of metal cations and a non-metal anion. Based simply on the atoms that are present, I think we can now classify these. And when I looked within the video, people were doing a really good job. So when I ask you to stop and then place these in, I was seeing a really strong consensus. I was seeing folks being able to group together ones that included all the nonmetals and ones that included their metal cations present and calling those ionic. So really good job, I thought, within, uh, within that part of your analysis. Sydney explains um, a strategy that I think is the one that I would be using as well. I'm just looking at the elements and I'm thinking about, are they non-metals or is there something that includes a metal cation? Now, in terms of then the corresponding structure that goes with these, at the particle level, as far as how they're assembled, turns out molecular substances and these ionic compounds are really different. So here I show a description for, um, acetic acid, which is a molecule. And here I show sodium chloride and uh, magnesium oxide, and these are ionic examples. Let's make sense of the ionic ones first. When I'm looking at these with an ionic one, I don't have any small discrete molecule. And by discrete, I mean individual separate from the others. When I am looking at an ionic compound, it just keeps going and going and going in three dimensions. When I'm looking at a molecular one, I have a specific discrete molecule. That's something that I wanna be able to think about. 
And that also is showing up with the way the formulas are written. So as I'm thinking about these ionic ones, a couple of different points that come to mind as being important for ionic compounds. When we have an ionic compound, it's always being written as the empirical formula. The empirical formula is the simple, simplest whole number ratio for the parts that are present. Ionic compounds are always written using an empirical formula. Ionic compounds include a cation and an anion, and the overall charge ends up being zero. The overall charge from the cations equals the overall charge from the anions. And then my last thought is, we are gonna know the charge of the, of the ions that are present because we're gonna be able to know that information that we just talked about a moment ago when it comes to the charges and their placement on the periodic table. Let me show you what I mean about that. But first of all, this idea of why is a ionic compound always with an empirical formula? Megan here had a good question. I'm kind of confused about this point. I'm confused why the ionic compound uses an empirical formula. My explanation within this one is that when we have an ionic compound, we don't have that small discrete individual molecule. When I write something like NaCl, I am not thinking about just one sodium cation and one chloride anion. I'm thinking of a collection of those. It might be 50 of each or a thousand of each or 10,000s of each or a hundred thousand or 10 million. And 10 million, it turns out, is not far-fetched because our atoms are so small. In all of the cases, though, the ratio is the same. We don't have a specific number present. So because we don't have a specific number, we can only talk about the ratio and that's what the empirical formula communicates. It's communicating to us that ratio. And this will be true whenever we have ionic compounds. It's always going to be the empirical formula that communicates what the ratio is, the simplest whole number ratio. Let's look at the formulas now for a few different ionic compounds. So I list here ones that we would have classified just a moment ago. Let's consider how these end up getting named. So first of all, look at the pattern right here. It seems like every time I have an ionic compound, I'm putting the cation first, and then I'm putting the anion. In each of these cases, I see the cation first and then the anion. So if I have calcium combined with chlorine, let's say I'm making an ionic compound out of that. How would I do it? Well, calcium, I know is gonna be plus two because it's in my plus two column. Chlorine is going to become chloride, which is in my minus one column. So I know that this has to be the formula. I know this has to be the formula because the overall charge is gonna to equal to zero. Calcium is in my plus two column. Chloride is in my minus one column. So I have plus two coming from the cations and then a minus one and another minus one. So I know that the formula must be one calcium and two chlorides. The naming on that, we name the cation first and then we name the anions. And we see that those anions, frequently we add this IDE ending. So when calcium combines with chlorine to make an ionic compound, here's the formula and we call that calcium chloride. What I'd like you to do is see if you can use the periodic table here. What would be the formula for when we make an ionic compound of oxygen with lithium, aluminum with oxygen, fluorine with potassium or iron three plus combined with oxygen. See if you can write what the formulas are. See if you can also begin to think about what their naming would be. Take a minute, take two minutes on that and then we'll share some ideas.
Okay, so let me share some answers with you. So what would I be expecting for each of these? Each of these I'm expecting that I'm going to have the metal cation first, then the anion second. The charges that go with those, I'm gonna definitely be using the periodic table to see their placement because I want the overall charge to end up being neutral. Here would be my work for that. Lithium's the metal cation and then the oxygen, Li2O. How do I know that? Oxygen is in the minus two column, lithium is in the plus one column. So I must have two lithiums there present. Aluminum oxide, oops, sorry, Al2O3. Kf, when I have potassium with fluorine. This last one right here, I needed the information that it was iron three plus because iron can have a variable number. Remember we said it could be plus two or plus three. So if it ends up being plus three, in order to have the overall charge and oxygen's minus two, I needed two and three respectively to make it work. When I'm gonna be adding the naming on this one, I would call the, uh, we had calcium chloride, below that I see lithium oxide, aluminum oxide, potassium fluoride, Fe2O3, I would name as iron three oxide. Remember the three is telling me what the, um, the charge was on the iron, iron three plus. Within this one, if we are talking about aluminum oxide, if you tell me aluminum oxide right away, I know what the formula is because we're all chemists here. When you tell me aluminum oxide, I know that that aluminum is three plus and I know the oxygen is two minus. How do I know that? Because that's the column that they're placed at on the periodic table. So I know these must be the subscripts that go with it. The one where I needed additional information within the naming was this case involving iron. Because we said iron could either be plus two or plus three. So we needed to designate that. Now, if I were to put this all together in a more complex case, how about the naming for something like this? I give the formula. Fe with a subscript of two, and then SO4, and I have three of those. This is bringing together a lot of the ideas that I've been presenting so far. I know that it's going to be involving iron. And then the second part right here, the only way that I can answer this, I need to have memorized what this is right here. That is a polyatomic anion. It's one of the ones that was on our chart just a moment ago. I need to know that that is representing SO4 with a two minus charge. I need to know that so I can figure out to, how to put together all the parts here. And that turns out that it's iron three sulfate. The reason that it's so crucial for you to memorize the polyatomic anions, they come together in so many other parts of the chemistry as well. So I know right now you're not fluent with that. I need you to have memorized those polyatomic, the common polyatomic anions, because they're going to show up all the time in different ways. Nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, hydroxide, acetate, all of those within that. I really need you familiar with that because we're going to be building on those ideas. Sooner you can memorize that, the better. Now, when we're looking at ionic compounds then, once we know the plan here, if we've memorized or we're able to figure out the cations and the anion, we could just put them together in all the different combinations. So look at this example right here. We could fill in everything in this box because we're just putting them together with the correct combination. If I were to look more closely at the ones that I show here in bold, in each case within my formula, I'd list the cation first and then the anion. In each of the cases here, I also want to make it so the overall charge ends up being zero. Just to choose one example right here, we said that NH4 plus, that's called ammonium. CO3 two minus is called carbonate. So I would need two of the plus one charges to go with the minus two charge. That makes the entire formula there neutral. And I'm listing it with a polyatomic cation and then a polyatomic anion. All of these we would also then be able to name. That combination right there would be a ammonium carbonate. So that's the plan that we have when we're naming ionic compounds.
it's crucial that we know the name and the charge for the cation, the name and the charge for the anion. Then we're just sticking them together and we're expressing that as the empirical formula. That was our approach here when we were looking at ionic compounds. Now let's look over here at molecular ones. So within molecular ones, we end up having these discrete specific molecules. F2 would be an example. And it turns out F2, that's an important example for us. F2 is an example of what's called a diatomic molecule. Turns out there are seven elements that when we find them in nature, they occur as pairs of atoms together in diatomic molecules. This is another thing that I'd like you to uh, have memorized, be familiar with. Which elements do that? It's hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and then down that column of the halogens. When we're thinking about what takes place within those, here I show our description here of H2O, how we could that have that be as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Notice in all of the cases there, we're always keeping that same discrete unit, the H2O molecule. If we were to think about something for a diatomic, like the O2, when I have that one, notice as a solid, I'm still seeing that O2 molecule present. If I were to think, well, what would it look like for any of those if I were to change the um, state? if I'm thinking about those as solid liquids or gases, at the particle level in each of those cases, I'm preserving that molecule and I can just change its arrangement, whether I'm looking at it as, as a solid or a liquid and a gas. Each of these, when they're found as the elements, they're these diatomic molecules. Now, when I'm looking at them within this one, how do I now begin to name molecules? Some of these I think you're probably familiar with. This idea of carbon dioxide, I'm pretty confident you've heard of the word carbon dioxide before. And if I were to look at the formula here, CO2, my hunch is that you've seen that before, you ha you'd have a really good chance of labeling that, identifying it as carbon dioxide. Let's look more closely at what you've done though, if you call that carbon dioxide. You're naming the element that comes first. You're naming then the element that comes second. And you're telling me how many oxygens are there. That's what the dye corresponds to. What we end up doing is we have different prefixes that are used to tell me how many of those particular atoms are present. Carbon dioxide is telling me carbon with two oxygens. As I say here at the bottom, a prefix is used to denote for us the number of atoms that we have of each element in the compound. But we don't include mono to designate one when it's the first. So if this is carbon dioxide, what do you think the one is right below it? I'd again call it carbon, but that would be carbon monoxide, designating one. See if you can name these other ones. CCL4, NO2, N2O4. Use this naming scheme and use the appropriate prefixes. Give that a try and then I'll share my work. When I'm naming these within the set, this would be my work. Carbon monoxide, now it's designating carbon and then the oxygen where I only have one oxygen present. Carbon tetrachloride, tetra is telling me four. Nitrogen dioxide, this is very similar to carbon dioxide as I look at it. Then the very last one, that's the first example where I had to use a prefix to tell me how many I had for that first atom. Dinitrogen tet tetraoxide. Sometimes that last part sort of gets squished together. Tetroxide is how that would be called. Now within these, what I'm seeing, couple thoughts. 
These are when I'm now naming some neutral molecules. These are not polyatomic anions I've memorized. These are neutral molecules. All of these are molecules with nonmetals. This is the approach I use when I have what are called binary. I have two different atoms present. So this is a different naming scheme. Now you might notice, well, why do we include a prefix here? We did not include a prefix when we were looking at ionic ones. Well, look at the oxygen. In one case, I could have two oxygens in the molecule. In the other case, I could have one. That kind of variability, I don't have that with ionic compounds because with ionic compounds, I know what the charges are going to be. And if I know what the charge is, then I know how they fit together. When we're looking at these molecules, they're not fitting together with cations and anions. There's a different arrangement for what's going on here, a different type of bonding. And we'll talk more about different types of bonding later in the semester. But that's why a prefix is necessary. This last example has nitrogen and oxygen. I have one example as an NO2 molecule, the other as an N2O4. Another thought within here, as we return to another feature here, look at this one involving magnesium and Br2. I call this magnesium bromide. So if we stop and think about, well, what is that describing? A couple of different choices here. Is that describing magnesium and a Br2 molecule? Magnesium two plus and a Br2 two minus or magnesium two plus and a bromide and another bromide. We wanna be a little careful here. Br2, that is a diatomic molecule when you find it in nature, all by itself when you're talking about bromine. But when I'm looking at this description right here, I think that matches up best with saying it's magnesium two plus, and then I have Br minus and another Br minus. I'm seeing that listed as an ionic compound. And those are the features that are present. I know when I've looked at students' um, work, this is an error that they frequently make. They've memorized that something like Br2 or Cl2 are diatomic molecules. And when they see them in ionic compounds, they're trying to think about them still as being molecules. When they're in an ionic compound right here, they're certainly not. They're certainly the specific anions as magnesium two plus, a Br minus, and another Br minus. See if that makes sense for you. Now, question within this one. This is one, uh, this is an end of chapter problem that I think is on this topic. This is one that was in the video as well. It says, which of these following diagrams most likely represents an ionic compound and how about a molecular one? When I looked within students' responses within this one, I thought that there was a pretty good consensus that the one on the left was an ionic compound and the one on the right is a molecular one. I'm gonna agree with that one, okay? This student here says the one, uh, the diagram on the left is an ionic compound. The diagram on the right is a molecular one. Now notice though what they're looking at. I wanna sort of correct this or adjust this a little bit. I like their analysis where they're seeing this pattern of cation anion, cation anion, cation anion throughout. That's what they're calling this repeating arrangement. I agree with that. One thing I wanna to add to this though is this idea of having a repeating arrangement, you have a repeating arrangement in any solid. Solids are arranged, crystalline solids are arranged with a repeating pattern. If you take something like carbon dioxide solid, that's dry ice, this is what it looks like in terms of its crystal structure. If I look at that, I see a repeating pattern. I see ones that are all tilted to the left, then all tilted to the right, then all tilted to the left. And this keeps going on throughout. The key thing though, that I would say makes carbon dioxide a molecular substance and not an ionic compound, even as a solid, I still see this distinct molecule. I still see this distinct molecule separate from its neighbors. It's in a repeating pattern, but even as a solid, it is still the distinct molecule. If I look over at this ionic representation, I don't see any spaces, right? I just see them all completely together throughout. So that would be 
I, I agree that this one's an ionic. I just sort of wanted to get at the misconception. There's a repeating pattern in both. The key thing that I'm looking for though, is if it's a molecular one, it's a repeating pattern, but there's also spaces and I'm preserving the specific molecules themselves. That's what I'm thinking about taking place at the particle level. Let's see if we can wrap up with this question, okay? Let's see if we can wrap up with this one. It says, the following represents an ionic compound. Blue spheres are the cations and the red spheres are the anions. Which of these would be consistent with the drawing? Take a second, see, I'll share my work and I'll discuss it through with you in just a second. How would you begin to analyze that? How would you begin to connect this particle representation with what the formula might be? I'll talk through the different options in just a second. See if you can narrow down your choices. See which ones you can eliminate and then we'll work from there. Okay, so if I were to begin to eliminate a few of these, this idea right here, this brings together a lot of different parts of the chapter. So one thing that I'm doing when I'm looking at this, it says that it represents an ionic compound. I say, okay, yeah, I can see that. It looks like there's no spaces, they're all right together. It's this pattern involving cations and anions. Okay, so I'm visually looking at that thinking ionic compound. Next, if I look more closely, it says the blue spheres are the cations and the red ones are the anions. So if I look at it closely, it looks like I have two cations for every one anion. In the empirical formula, I should have two cations for every one anion. Those are the features that I'm looking for when I'm seeking to eliminate the choices. So the very first one at the top, KBr, I would call that potassium bromide. Is that an ionic compound? Yes. Does it have two cations for every one anion? It does not. It looks like it is a one-to-one -one ratio, so I could rule out potassium bromide. If I jump to the bottom one, this is iron three sulfate. How about that one? Well, that would be an ionic compound. But if I look at the subscripts, I would need two cations for every three anions. If I look at the what it's trying to describe here, that doesn't appear to be the case. I think that that is an ionic compound, but it's not having the correct ratio for the features. That's leaving me three choices that I have remaining. K2SO4, H2S, and calcium nitrate. Rather than jumping in and saying, okay, here's my answer, here's my reasoning. Let's pick up here next time. Let's pick up here next time. And what my goal next time is, we're going to finish up this aspect of naming. We'll look a little bit at the naming for acids and, and, um, acids and some simple organic ones. And then we're gonna start chapter three. I think folks have been paying attention in, in a great way and you've already been processing a lot of information. So let's pick up here when we move on, okay? We're gonna finish on this slide, wrap up the last little bit of um, chapter two and then move on to chapter three. And it, it's a cat, all right? Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, I'll hang around if you got questions. Hi. Um... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, 
Is it definitionally true that ions, ionic compounds are composed of a metal and a non-metal, or is that just generally true? Um, they're always going to be a cation and an anion. But if I were to think about it, like if I do, um, my cation could be ammonium, and that would be a polyatomic, and my ammonium is consisting, right, of NH4+. plus. So mm -hmm. that's another way that I could get a cation. So I'm going to say definitionally, I've got a cation and an anion. Oftentimes, okay. those cations are going to be metal cations, but they don't have to be. And then can you have a, um, a molecule, like a covalent bond or, or a molecule that's a metal and a non-metal, or is it never the case that it's a metal and a non-metal for a molecular substance? The... Um, you you can, but I don't think we're going to encounter any of those. I think mm -hmm. any time in this class when we're looking at combinations of metals and nonmetals, they're always going to be in ionic compounds where the metal ends up being a cation. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. So for the um, image that you're on right now, where it says like, let's say for like the bottom one that 